Hello everyone, welcome to another one of my fix videos. If you're new here, I take movies that don't work and try to make them work a little better. As always, when I'm fixing a movie that's part of a larger franchise, I take the fixes I included from previous movies and incorporate them when I'm making my fixes for later movies. And my version of X2 is pretty different than the X2 that we got, and that will make my fix for X3 even more different, on top of the changes I would have made anyway. Now, if you've seen this movie, you know that there's actually two movies fighting each other for dominance here. You've got the Dark Phoenix stuff, which follows the death of Jean Grey at the end of the previous movie. But you've also got the Mutant Cure storyline, based on Joss Whedon and John Cassidy's Astonishing X-Men storyline from the comics just a couple of years earlier. This movie fails because it tries to do both of those movies in only an hour and 44 minutes. That's how long the first movie was, but it also didn't have nearly as many plot things to juggle as this one does. If they were going to try to do both of these plots, they should have gone past two hours. To be honest, even if they were only going to do one of these plots, they should have still gone past two hours, especially if they were going to shove as many characters into this movie as they eventually did. So my first fix here is a big one. I would split this up into two movies. Have X-Men The Last Stand be the Mutant Cure storyline. This feels like the logical step to go in this mutant human war that's been building up for two movies. Then you do the Dark Phoenix storyline. By this point, you've already got a pretty successful franchise on your hands with two very well-loved movies. So just have some faith that the third movie is going to do well enough to warrant a fourth movie and save the return of Jean Grey for that movie. And if The Last Stand doesn't do well enough to get a sequel, then Jean's death in X2 stands well enough on its own that it doesn't have to be followed up on, even if pretty much everyone knew that it was going to be. Now, ordinarily, when I'm doing my fixed videos, I wouldn't say, let's just create a brand new movie that didn't exist. I try, but don't always stick the landing, to work with what was done in the movie. But since it's very clear to me that this is really two potential movies both being squeezed into one actual movie, I figured the best way to fix this was to do the most logical thing. And this way, I can kind of have a stab at fixing the 2019 Dark Phoenix movie, but we'll just pretend it came out in like 2008 or 2009 instead of 2019. Now the downside of splitting this up into two movies is that there isn't a whole lot of plot stuff dealing with the cure in the movie that we got. It kind of takes a back seat to the Dark Phoenix stuff, leaving me with not a whole lot to work with here. You might say I could look at the mutant cure storyline from the comics that this movie was borrowing from, but quite a bit of that story dealt with the return of Colossus who had been presumed dead for about five years, and an alien empire who kept Colossus in prison and gave the mutant cure to human scientists. And none of that will work in this movie because I haven't killed off Colossus and I don't want to bring aliens into this franchise. So a lot of this video will be more or less rebuilding this movie from the ground up. So let's get into it. Remember Mystique? She's back, baby. Ever since Magneto got arrested at the end of the first movie, she's been doing guerrilla attacks on different anti-mutant facilities and sneaking around snooping in different places around the country that are part of some big anti-mutant conspiracy. There's a big thing with the Friends of Humanity, which is an anti-mutant organization in the comics. It turns out that Mystique is crucial in their plans. She realizes too late that she's been following breadcrumbs deliberately left by the Friends. Mystique still has the depowering weapon she used on Charles Xavier in the first movie, and once the Friends of Humanity kidnap her, they take it. They've been working on their own variation of this technology for some time. You could even say they have some people in the government who knew about this weapon, but since Mystique stole the only surviving model, their research was stalled. Now that they have Forge's original weapon, they're able to quickly design their own much more potent depowering weapon, and they use it on Mystique. Those of you who are bigger fans of Mystique than I am, I do apologize for completely removing her from X2 and then depowering her at the very beginning of this one. But at least I gave her a little bit more of her comic book personality in my fix for the first X-Men movie, so hopefully you enjoyed that. One thing I didn't like about the movie we got was how much some of the X-Men talk about how good things have been for mutants lately. You see a mutant working with the president who is apparently pretty sympathetic to mutants on the whole, but they spent two movies foreshadowing this war between humans and mutants, and even though this movie kinda gives it to us, you blow all that momentum you were building when you say that things are peachy keen for mutants at the beginning of this movie. So it would be kinda hard to convey this here, but I would want this to feel like a natural escalation of what has gone down in the previous films. So Mystique will seek out Magneto, who is trying something new. In my fix for the previous movie, he said he wasn't ready to completely join Charles Xavier because he believes there's still threats out there. But we will find out here that he is getting tired of the fight, and while he is keeping vigilant of the more extreme elements of humanity, he isn't preparing open war against the humans like he was almost ready to do in the first movie. He's out living in a forest somewhere, he's grown out a beard, because I think that would have been cool if they had actually gone in that direction, which at one time they talked about for this movie. So since I put firm timeline stuff for my previous two fixes, with Magneto sporting a nice beard here, that puts this less than six months after my fix for X2. So we're talking late 2000 or very early 2001. And Magneto is trying his hand at building a mutant community away from the humans, where he maybe can have a go at a life of peace. Kind of like his plans for Asteroid M in the early 90s, but not actually on an asteroid. There's quite a few mutants who have pledged their loyalty to Magneto here, and Pyro is one of them. After a week or two of searching for him, Mystique will somehow find Magneto and tell him what the Friends of Humanity are planning. They have a cure for mutants, and they have weapons. It. 
it. Even though there's no love lost between these two, after Mystique left Magneto to rot in prison in the second movie, Magneto is not happy about this. He can't say he's surprised, though. He did warn Charles and the X-Men at the end of my fix for X2 that humanity was going to try something, and they do, like right now. Turns out the Friends of Humanity allowed Mystique to escape, and they followed her, hoping that she would lead them to a big nest of mutants that they can force their cure on. A big battle will rage, leaving all of this group of the Friends of Humanity dead, and several of Magneto's followers killed or cured. If you want specifics, let's go with some of the acolytes that aren't incredibly important in the comics, but fans might recognize. I think one of the biggest problems this movie has, other than the things I've already mentioned, is how it will bring in characters who are pretty important in a comics, and then waste them with like one line of dialogue, like Psylocke, or Multiple Man, or Juggernaut, who has turned into an internet meme in this movie. I mean, I'm not even the biggest fan of any of these characters, but you could have saved them for bigger parts later on. There are hundreds of minor mutant characters this movie could have gone with to be followers of Magneto. Don't turn Multiple Man into a follower of Magneto. We'll never be able to use him again. Magneto will look out at the devastation, tears rolling down his face. He closes the eyes of Mystique, a warrior who died in the war he prayed he was wrong about. Again, sorry Mystique fans, but maybe this is better than Hell Hath No Fury Like a Woman Scorn. Magneto's followers silently look at him, waiting for his command. Magneto turns to them and says, to me, my brotherhood. Getting to the heroes of our movie, we will see that Charles Xavier is starting to get his powers back, but it's slow and he's getting frustrated with how long it's taking. We will see a more serious version of the what card am I holding up game from Ghostbusters, where Xavier is struggling with his telepathy. This will show another side to Xavier we usually don't get to see, where he is normally the patient wise father figure. Here we will see how he really is angry at how weak he is and how he feels useless to his children, much as he tries to put on a brave face. Since Jean Grey does not come back in this movie, Cyclops does not get unceremoniously killed off screen. Cyclops becomes even more driven to make sure that what happened to Jean does not happen to any of the other X-Men. This is something one of the screenwriters of X2, Michael Doherty, wanted to do. And since we've already got Forge in my fixes for these movies, and he feels responsible for Jean's death, since she wouldn't have been in that situation if Professor X had not been depowered by a weapon of his making, he will help Cyclops build the Danger Room. In between movies, Cyclops has stepped down as field leader and is much more active at the school, even outside of training the adults to work better as a team. Not to be too melodramatic, but he has a hole in his heart where Jean used to go, and now he has to find a way to fill that hole. When Jean died in the comics, he did that by going into the world and becoming a sailor for a little bit, and later going to work for his grandparents in Alaska. Which makes sense, but we don't have that kind of time. So instead, Cyclops is now trying to be a better teacher to the students, which we already established in my fix for the first movie, that he wasn't as comfortable with that aspect of the X-Men as he was field missions. But on top of trying to help the field guys improve their teamwork and individual use of their powers in the danger room, he's also pushing the students to be better, academically and in the training of their own powers. Maybe Banshee can have a scene with Scott where he says, Hi, boyo! Do you guys like my Irish accent? You're a natural! We should have had you teaching at the school a long time ago, ack! I wouldn't want to devote too much time to this, but maybe after seeing the death of Jean, Cyclops will gently be encouraging the students not to pursue life as an X-Man. It was never mandatory. Students could build a life outside of the school after they graduated if they wanted to. And maybe Cyclops wants that for them, to push them away from possibly ending up like Jean. I don't really know where I would go with that, other than maybe someone like Wolverine calling him out on it. Hey, that kid would be great in the field. We've both seen how good he is in the danger room. Why not let him come with us on a small mission? They're not all going to end up like Jean. Something like that. I don't want Cyclops to be as despondent as he was in the movie that we got, but I definitely want his reaction to Jean's death to feel real while we try to make him not devolve into an unlikable character for how he reacts. Forge and Storm are now split up. Their relationship was already on the rocks in my fix for X2, but Forge was still trying to salvage it, while Storm was still pretty angry about him building anti-mutant weapons and not telling anyone about it. But now, Forge is the one who kinda calls it quits, and he and Storm are more or less back to being friends. She sees how much of an asset he has been over the course of the movies, and even though they're not a couple, she is glad that he has stuck around. And with that, Wolverine and Storm will kinda sorta be in a relationship. I've liked Storm and Wolverine as a couple since before they were officially a couple after the events of Avengers vs. X. X-Men. I first noticed a chemistry between these two when they were the veteran members of the team and the rest of the X-Men were a bunch of rookies they were trying to train. And that's kind of what we would be doing in this movie. Apparently, for the three minutes that Matthew Vaughn was going to direct this movie, he was going to have these two be a couple, although I haven't actually seen a script or anything from his time on this movie, so I don't know if that's definitely something that he would have done or just a rumor. But it's a relationship I like from the comics, so I would go there, even if Vaughn wasn't going to. What about Wolverine and Jean? Well, what about them? I never liked Wolverine and Jean's hinted romance in these movies. He only only interacted with her a couple of times over the course of these movies, and they treated it like some tragic star-crossed lovers situation, but that wasn't what it was at all. And since in my fix for X2, Jean and Cyclops switched places, leaving us with even less interactions between Jean and Logan, that means Wolverine is free to move on to a relationship with Storm. It's not too serious, they're still just kind of figuring things out, but they definitely have a connection. 
Banshee, I'll get to him in a minute, but he's not been at the school the last few weeks. Iceman and Rogue have graduated to the field team. I'd want to see something kind of like Star Trek with a clear hierarchy of students who become full on X-Men. You have to do this many hours in the danger room before you can go on a field mission, and you have to do this many hours in the field before you're allowed to fly the jet, that sort of thing. Iceman and Rogue were fast-tracked to being on the team because of how well they acquitted themselves during the events of the previous movie. Hopefully this won't be making things too crowded, but we will also have Archangel be part of the team. I didn't like how these movies would introduce characters and then ignore them, and since I replaced Nightcrawler with Archangel in my fix for X2, that means we will need to do something with him in this movie. We'll say he's a year or two older than Bobby and Rogue, so he's too old to be a student, but he doesn't really have a place in the world, so he feels like the X-Men is where he belongs. Something I will be keeping from the movie we got is that Warren's father is funding the cure. We'll explain that shortly after Warren's mutation kicked in, he ran away from home because his father couldn't handle it, and then not too long after that, he got kidnapped by Stryker and turned into Archangel. Warren's dad won't be quite as radical in his disdain of mutants as the Friends of Humanity, but he did distance himself from Warren when he found out about this. He still loves his son, but he does not like that his son is a mutant. Still bad, but not as bad as the Friends of Humanity. Oh, and keen-eyed viewers will notice that Warren's dad has a pin on his lapel that looks like a trident. This will be a small little Easter egg hinting at the existence of the Hellfire Club, which, if you're confused, the club consists mostly of non-mutants who are extremely rich and elite, but the leaders of the club are secretly mutants, and they are manipulating and controlling the members of the club to use their status and wealth to their own ends. So Warren's father is being encouraged to fund this mutant cure thing that the Friends of Humanity have stumbled upon. You might ask why. Well, if the leaders of the club see themselves as one day sitting on top of the world through covert manipulation of politics and business circles, then it will be easier for them to achieve their goals with their enemies or potential enemies depowered. Apparently, if Brian Singer had made the X-Men 3 that he wanted to make, he was going to include the Hellfire Club, as well as Magneto's Brotherhood and the X-Men. While we don't really know what he would have done, other than possibly cast Sigourney Weaver as Emma Frost, I have to say this sounds like it would have been even worse than the X3 that we got. Having three separate teams all trying to control the out of control Phoenix would have been a huge mess in my opinion. So no Hellfire Club in this movie other than small hints. All we will find out in this movie is that Warren's dad found out about the Friends of Humanity and them getting a hold of Forge's depowering weapon and he thinks this is his chance to maybe reconcile with his son and even repair many families impacted by the air quotes mutant problem. So he throws lots of money at these guys so they can find a way to make a chemical version of their technological cure. This can be where you include Dr. Kavita Rao if you like that character. Now, unlike the movie we got, where the cure being announced to the public is the inciting incident that kicks off the actions of a few of our characters, here, we will say that there have been rumors of the cure floating around for a little while now. The bulk of this fix takes place a couple of weeks after Mystique died, and so the Friends of Humanity have had Mystique's depowering weapon for about a month, and maybe they've been going around trying to depower individual mutants here and there, but it's all just rumors. In our inciting incident, Magneto makes a very public attack on one of the bases of the Friends of Humanity and kills everyone there. This could be where you put your Senator Kelly cameo, since I kept him alive in my version of the first X-Men movie. I haven't gotten to use him as much as I'd like, but a movie like this where a mutant cure is being developed and a group of mutants violently react to that, Kelly would definitely be hitting the podium to speak his mind. So even if it's just on televisions in the background, he needs to be present in this movie. I wasn't sure how far to take Magneto's actions in this movie. I'm more of a fan of Magneto being an enemy of the X-Men, but not actually being a bad guy. In the comics, he does some bad stuff, but there's usually something of a justification. Like when he sunk the Russian submarine, it was threatening him. That's how I like Magneto. So when I originally was thinking of what I would do in my version of this movie, I figured I would have a depowered Mystique tell Magneto what happened to her, and then he would get mad and get back on the horse. But this was problematic because when I thought of this, I was still thinking of Magneto as a well-meaning extremist. Very extreme, yes, but still well-meaning. I was still considering the Friends of Humanity to be the big villains of this movie. But if they're the big bad guys, then things more or less will culminate with Magneto and the X-Men teaming up to fight them. And we just did that in the previous movie with a different human adversary. So much as I don't like seeing Magneto be put on the more villainous side of villainy, it had to happen to serve the needs of this story. This goes back to me wanting things to escalate further than they have in the previous movies. In the first two movies, the existence of the X-Men has still been kept under wraps, even with all the stuff going on. The general public doesn't know that there are militant groups of mutants fighting each other, with humanity trapped in the middle. And while I wouldn't want to paint the Friends of Humanity in a good light here, from the point of view of someone just finding out about this mutant terrorist killing humans, you could see how they would think that the cure is a good idea to be weaponized in case of something like this. So that scene in the movie where Magneto is making a speech on TV, that's going to happen closer to the beginning of the movie, and the X-Men will probably be making a bigger deal about this. Oh, cat's out of the bag now. If we're going to do something to put a stop to this before things get even more out of hand, then the world is going to find out about us also. This is where we will meet Beast in the same way that he is introduced in the movie. He is the Secretary of Education in the President's Cabinet. And while we're on the subject, let's just say this is the same President as the previous movie. It has been just long enough for Magneto to grow 
beard, but not so long that we're in an entirely different presidential administration. Like I said, there have been rumors of a mutant cure floating around, but Beast probably ignored that because if that was a thing, he would have known about it, right? But on Magneto's broadcast, Beast will see the cure does exist and it's already been weaponized. And so Beast is a little upset. He goes to the president and asks if he knew about this. The president will dodge the question and we will find out that yes, he did know about this. He probably knew about the original gun that Forge designed that this cure is based on, but he's been hearing rumors of the activities of the Friends of Humanity and he's been having his people look into it. Beast is not happy. Why wasn't I notified about this? I could have warned my friends. Another thing that we will be keeping from the movie is that Beast is one of Charles's original students and is probably about the same age as Storm and Cyclops, maybe just a year or two older. So Magneto's broadcast will probably hit him especially hard because Magneto was probably his teacher before he became a terrorist. And while this president isn't full on against mutants, he is definitely wary, especially after what almost happened to him in the previous movie. Yeah, he knows Archangel was being mind controlled by a human, but that doesn't change the fact that Warren could have killed him even if he wasn't mind controlled. So the president is not super worked up about this like Beast thinks that he should be. And so the president will maybe say, Mr. McCoy, I value you as a member of my staff, but don't overestimate your importance here. This situation is being handled. And Beast understands now that he was hired more or less as a token mutant and not because he is a brilliant scientist. Beast will resign and go to the X-Men to see if together they can put a stop to this before it gets even further out of hand. One thing I don't much care for in the movie is that Beast returns to his position with the president after he helps the X-Men. Another instance of introduce a character with no intention of using them again in later movies. Beast gets to the mansion as the X-Men start to formulate a game plan. In the movie, this is where the adults are discussing the merits of a cure. And while that is maybe one of the best parts of the movie, it would be out of place here because they will be discussing the best strategy to take out Magneto. But we'll still have Rogue be tempted by the cure much like she was in the movie. Apparently, one reason Rogue was basically written out of the movie with so little to do is because Anna Paquin was filming The Squid and the Whale at the time that this movie was in production. Allegedly, this is also why Cyclops and Mystique's roles were reduced in the movie. But in my hypothetical world where my changes are being implemented to improve these movies, the studio does not demand that this movie get made right this instant, which I think everyone agrees resulted in an inferior product. If we take our time making this movie, we can accommodate everyone's schedule, and we're not abruptly writing out the character who was a pretty big part of the first two movies. Not to mention her motivations for depowering send the wrong message, right? It's okay to fundamentally change who you are if it's for a boy that you like. This sentiment is shared by Michael Doherty, so it's likely that they would have gone in a different direction if he had stayed with this franchise after X2. And I get why Rogue wouldn't like her powers, because they make it much more difficult for her to interact with and be part of society. To her, they are much more of a disability than what anyone else we've seen in a series has to go through, with the exception of Cyclops. But I still don't like the direction they went in depowering Rogue. So we need a scene where she somehow uses her abilities in a positive way, and even though she's tempted to use the cure, she realizes that while it has caused some problems for her, she has used her abilities to save people, and she accepts that this is part of her now, and she doesn't need to be cured. She'll see how frustrating it has been for Professor Xavier since he was depowered, and that this won't solve all of her problems. You might say that Professor Xavier's powers are pretty awesome and are not problematic, while Rogue has a death touch. If Rogue considers taking the cure, she and Professor X can have a conversation about this. Professor X can say when she first met him, he had control of his powers. But when his mutation first kicked in, it was a nightmare for him, and he tried to isolate himself from humanity because his powers were just as socially crippling for him as they are for Rogue right now. He tells her that eventually he was able to overcome his mutation and turn it into an asset, and he believes Rogue will one day do the same. In our strategy session, we will get a big bombshell dropped. After Professor Xavier revealed the existence of the X-Men to the President in the previous movie, Xavier and the President's right-hand man who deals with mutant affairs have come to a tense, not entirely pleasant understanding with each other. We will call this guy Agent Duncan. In the event that something huge is going to happen, the President and Duncan want mutants on their side who can handle the situation. And Xavier's whole dream is about coexistence between humans and mutants, so on paper this sounds great, but he does not agree with some of the missions Duncan wants the X-Men involved with. And since the President is already uneasy about mutants after seeing what some of them are capable of, it's an uneasy alliance. And nobody knew about this, including Beast, who was just working for the President like an hour ago. I'm not sure how plausible it is that the Professor would be able to keep this alliance a secret from the other X-Men, but I think it can work. The movie had an Xavier who was willing to compromise to achieve his dream, and that's the direction we will be going with here. Except instead of rewriting a child's personality, he's willing to include his team in the shadowy elements of government ops. So that conversation in the Dark Phoenix movie, where Mystique wasn't okay with doing missions for the government, it will be like that, but less terrible. The X-Men's whole thing is that they are feared and hated by a world they are sworn to protect. So making a stink about saving the world that hates and fears them is a little weird, but taking missions from the shady government, we can have a heated discussion about that. This Force Government Alliance, they did something like this in the Ultimate X-Men comics in the early 2000s. The government sent Wolverine to kill an innocent teenager, and you had the government deciding that this kid won't go to the school, we're going to snatch him up and use him for our own purposes. 
experience. So while we wouldn't go quite that far here, you can have those possibilities broached by people who are not on board with this. We will find out Banshee was hijacked into working with a team of human soldiers looking for the Friends of Humanity. Since he was part of Interpol before he became an X-Man, he is the best suited for this kind of mission. Like the Professor, he is not exactly happy with this arrangement, but he figures it's better to have even limited resources from the government at their disposal in an emerging crisis like this than to be working alone, or even worse, against the government. Neither Banshee nor Professor Xavier like the prospect of what might happen if they say no to the government. Neither of them are certain the government won't resort to forcefully using the cure if they suspect the mutants won't be cooperative. As far as they're both concerned, this is the best possible scenario. While this conversation is going on, Professor X gets a message from Pyro letting the X-Men know where Magneto is planning to attack next. While Pyro didn't think the X-Men had the right idea about how to do things at the end of the previous movie, he did not sign up for Team Magneto to slaughter dozens of humans, even with this war ramping up. This gives Pyro a little bit more to do here other than fight Iceman and offering to assassinate Xavier, which won't be here since I wanted him to be a tad more sympathetic. Also, any interactions between Iceman and Pyro, they need to be a little more friendlier with each other. In the previous movie, Iceman loses his family, and we also get hints that Pyro never had a family. After that, these two should have been like brothers instead of going at each other's throats in this movie. Professor Xavier talks to the team alone and tells them that he understands that some of them are uncomfortable with the position he has put them in. He tells them he hopes he can minimize his involvement with the government after they take care of Magneto, but he isn't sure if that's a possibility anymore. He asks them to forgive him for going down this slippery slope, and he tells them he will be going with Agent Duncan and his team to stop Magneto. He knows it is very unlikely Magneto intends to stop at this point, but he believes if anyone can talk him down from killing anyone else, he can do it. Xavier invites any of them who want to go with him to do so, and he offers an alternative to any of them who are still too uncomfortable with Xavier's government alliance. This is Beast's cue to tell them that before he left his job, he stole some files and found out that the cure is being produced at Worthington Labs by his old colleague Kavita Rao. Archangel is surprised to find out that his dad is involved in this, but not as surprised as everyone else when Professor Xavier asks those who will not come with him to confront Magneto to go to Worthington Labs to protect the staff producing the cure. He reminds them that while he finds the creation of the cure abhorrent, Dr. Rao and Archangel's father are not their enemies, but rather the Friends of Humanity who are forcing the cure on fellow mutants, and Magneto who is reacting to them. Like how we split our forces in the previous movie, we will do the same thing here. The guys who are not thrilled about Xavier forming an alliance with the government, who not too long ago sanctioned an attack on the school, but at least understand that this is necessary, at least until they can handle the threat of Magneto and his followers, and the ones who see the moral compromise as unacceptable. Going with Professor Xavier and Agent Duncan will be Banshee and Forge, both of whom have worked with the government before and are the least angry with Professor Xavier for his decision. Rogue and Iceman are both unsure what to do, and Storm tells them that she is going with the Professor to keep an eye on Agent Duncan, who she does not trust. Iceman and Rogue agree that this is a good idea, and Iceman goes with this group. Wolverine and Archangel will be especially upset with how this has played out, because Agent Duncan represents the same guy who was in bed with William Stryker in the previous movie, and that guy ruined their lives, so they want no part of Agent Duncan being part of the X-Men's world. However, they both feel like they owe the Professor for what he's done for them, so while they're both uneasy about this, they agree to go to Worthington Labs. Beast will go with them because he believes Dr. Rao might be more receptive to their arrival if she sees a friendly face, and he just left his position in the government and isn't too keen on the direction this alliance might lead the X-Men. Rogue will be going with them, and here's where we will be seeing some more of her indecision about if she should take the cure. Rogue can ask Beast if he's thought about taking the cure. Are you kidding, my child? Have you heard of the furry community? I'm taking away my biggest asset if I take this cure. Okay, no, no, we won't do that, but yeah, this is my headcanon. Cyclops will stay with the students at the school. While he does trust the professor, he is uneasy about this alliance. Duncan might try recruiting one of the students to his cause if Professor Xavier or the X-Men don't want to play ball, and since Cyclops has become more involved with the students in between movies, he wants to make sure that does not happen. And ye Cyclops fans, if you don't like that I relegated Cyclops to being a babysitter, fear not, I will be bringing him back before the credits roll. So our team that goes to Worthington Labs is welcomed about as warmly as can be expected. Archangel will have a strained reunion with his father, who even though he is still loath to accept that his son is a mutant, does show concern at how Warren went through some kind of transformation since the last time they saw each other. Warren is not blue in my fixes, since Stryker would have no reason to turn him blue, but his metal wings are alarming to Warren's dad. Archangel will probably snap and say it was someone a lot like the Friends of Humanity who did this to him, and then he storms off. The rest of the group is able to compose themselves a little better, but when Dr. Rao and Warren's dad insist that the Friends are just concerned citizens, Beast might let it slip that the Friends of Humanity have been forcing the cure on mutants, which will come as a shock to Dr. Rao and Archangel's dad. They legitimately had no idea the Friends of Humanity were going this far, though Wolverine will rightly point out that everyone he knows has heard rumors of mutants having the cure forced on them, so he isn't sure how the staff here hasn't heard about that yet. And if we want to paint the cure as not a black and white argument, we can see Tilde Soames, a young mutant who somehow accidentally killed her parents when her mutation first manifested. She has been taken in by Dr. Rao, and she actually wants the cure. While Rogue will 
will consider taking the cure and ultimately choose not to go through with it, Tilde represents mutants whose lives have been truly ruined by their mutation. Meanwhile, our other group finds the Friends of Humanity base that Pyro tipped them to, but they've arrived too late. Magneto and his acolytes have already torn through this location just like they did the other scene when Magneto televised his threats. Agent Duncan tells Charles that it's looking less likely that he will be able to bring his old friend in unharmed. But Magneto and his friends are not gone, and they surround the X-Men who have come to stop him. Magneto gives a speech to the team like the one in the Statue of Liberty in the first movie. Why can't any of you understand what I'm doing here? That sort of thing. I'm fighting them because if I don't, they will come for us. The ones who don't take the cure willingly will have it forced on them, and Magneto will fight tooth and nail to make sure that that does not happen. Charles tries to tell Magneto that the Friends of Humanity can still be stopped from carrying out their mission, but if Magneto continues, the flames of fear will only be stoked on both sides. Magneto tells Charles that he might have one day been interested in a civil debate, but as he sees the humans who Charles has cast his lot with, he is done talking. He's ready to show Charles and the rest of the world talking will not get anything done, only actions. And now is Magneto's chance to prove this, as a large squadron of the Friends of Humanity will attack both groups without distinguishing who is Agent Duncan tries to shout them down, tell them that he is a federal agent, but the friends don't listen, and they begin launching their cure weapons at the mutants. Iceman will try to throw up a big ice wall like he did in the previous movie, but because they're all surrounded, he will get hit from another side. Agent Duncan is able to get Charles on the ground and cover him, but many of the other mutants are not so lucky. Storm is somehow injured, but thankfully she was not hit with a cure. Banshee and Pyro both get hit with a cure, as well as several of the other acolytes. The battle does end with all of the Friends of Humanity at Magneto's mercy. They will pull the classic, please, I have a family. And and Magneto might gesture at one of the fallen acolytes who wasn't lucky enough to have only been hit with a cure. He had a family too, and he kills all of the attackers. I've said before that the movie depowered or killed so many characters that it made it nearly impossible to do sequels, and I stand by that, but I can see a dilemma the movie faced. With this being the conclusion to this big war that's been foreshadowed for two movies, you want the stakes to feel genuine, and if everyone comes out of this without a scratch, then the stakes do not feel genuine. So it's a fine line to walk. How many characters do you depower or kill off without making it impossible to follow up this movie? I preemptively made this less of a problem in my fixes for the earlier movies by adding extra characters like Banshee and Forge, and by not killing off Cyclops in the first act, so that we still have quite a few other characters laying around to use in later movies. Magneto lifts Agent Duncan off the ground and demands to know where the cure is being produced. Agent Duncan feigns ignorance, but Magneto knows that such a game changer as a cure for the mutant problem would be a top priority for the government. They would have had the location 10 minutes after hearing a cure was in production. When Agent Duncan still won't talk, Magneto rips Forge's metal leg off and liquefies it. He prepares to pour it into Agent Duncan's mouth, but he finally tells Magneto the cure is being made at Worthington Labs. With that, Magneto and two dozen of the Acolytes leave what is left of the X-Men and the cured followers to destroy the Worthington facility. Professor Xavier contacts the Worthington Labs team to warn them that they could not stop Magneto and he is on his way. While I don't mind Magneto having a bigger group following him during this movie, I wanted to keep it a little lower key than an entire army storming the facility to destroy the cure. We'll have a Seven Samurai situation with this small group that is definitely not equipped to take on an enraged Magneto trying to defend the humans who might see all of mutant kind depowered. Wolverine and Archangel are already screwed, since Magneto could throw them across the state if he wanted to. And Beast can hold his own in a brawl, but he doesn't have much to offer if Magneto decided to literally drop a bridge on the lab that they are in. So it's down to Rogue. Magneto will come to the lab and tell the X-Men inside that he will allow them to leave, but every human inside will die for the sins that they have unleashed on the world. Rogue comes flying out of the top floor with wings. She touched Archangel, absorbing his powers, though she does not exhibit his metal wings since those were man-made. She's able to surprise Magneto and get close enough to touch him. She knows she won't win with Magneto's followers backing him up, but her goal is only to weaken Magneto enough so that someone else might be able to take him out. But it doesn't work. Magneto is much more experienced in using his powers, and he throws Rogue away from him. He prepares to destroy the lab, including the X-Men inside. But the cavalry has just arrived. It's Cyclops and some of the upperclassmen students. When Xavier warned the team guarding the lab Magneto was coming, he also sent a message to Cyclops. Xavier said he needed as many people who Cyclops felt comfortable bringing in to in their assistance. At first, Cyclops wouldn't hear anything of this, but maybe Jubilee says that Cyclops trying to keep them from getting into this fight isn't going to work, and some of the students will someday get involved in dangerous situations anyway, so him trying to protect them is not doing them any good. So he fulfills his arc where he realizes that this is a dangerous job, people will die in battle, and if the X-Men are willing to put their lives on the line, Cyclops will help them in any way that he can. We'll get our big fight, and some of the bits from the movie that we got will play out here. We won't get the in chess the pawns go first line because I really hate that. Magneto 
Magneto should be fighting for mutants, not using them as disposable fodder. Mr. Worthington will get separated from everyone else, and one of the Acolytes will see him and knows that he's the one who's been paying for the widespread production of the cure. They will throw him off the building, but Archangel will save him. Dad will still have a long way to go, but is a little closer to accepting his son as he is. Our big fight scene will end with someone, either Dr. Rao or Agent Duncan, who was brought here by Storm, shooting Magneto with the cure. While I think this is a poetic ending to Magneto, I would rather it come from one of the humans than the X-Men, especially if we have any ethical debates from the X-Men on if the cure should be used. With Magneto depowered, the Acolytes scatter to the four winds. Some of them might have been depowered in the big battle, but many escaped. Unlike the movie, where the cure came from a person, and once he becomes a student at the school, you seemingly don't have the cure in production anymore, this fix will not be able to close Pandora's box. Even after Worthington's company stops making the cure, you'll have other companies trying to replicate it, and the Friends of Humanity will still have their weaponized version of the cure. The movie, even with all the death in it, still has too much of a happy ending. I like the idea that maybe the cure is still going to cause problems in the future, even if I might not be making a big plot point of it later on. After the fight, Magneto will be arrested, and this time it is very unlikely that he is going to be causing any problems in the future. The X-Men know that the cure might not be permanent, since it wasn't for Xavier, but they intend to cross that bridge when they get to it. Agent Duncan thanks the Professor and the X-Men for their help, and offers an invitation from the President to continue this partnership in indefinitely. Xavier says no thank you, the X-Men are going to be parting ways from Agent Duncan and his team. Duncan says this is not the best course of action and there could be other threats in the future that will be a danger to both mutants and humans alike. Xavier says that when that day comes, he and his students will be ready, but they will tackle those threats in their own way. A week or two later, the school opens its doors to any and all former mutants who have been cured. Xavier is not doing this because he suspects that their powers will come back, but rather he wants to build a better future and he hopes they can all do it together. He has a conversation with Beast, Cyclops, and Storm, his original students about how one day he hopes that he can open the doors of the school to human students as well, but he doesn't believe mutants or humans are quite ready for that yet. post credit scene. Yeah, by this point the X-Men movies were starting to do these sometimes, so this one will be a little different from the one that we got in the movie, since Charles did not die in this one. We cut to Alkali Lake. We see a couple of mutants, also wearing the Trident logo that Warren's father had, and they're scanning for energy signatures, and one of them says they found a heat source. Finally, we found her. And that's it for this one. This was a little tougher for me to crack than the other two that I've done in this series because it's not as good of a movie, so it needed more attention. And when you remove half the plot of a movie and try to rebuild it, it takes a little bit more time. But I hope you guys liked this video, and if you did, be sure to leave the likes, shares, comments, and subscribes. And if you did like it, be sure to check out some of my other videos I do when I'm not fixing movies. And if you really like this video, be sure to check out the next video where I will be offering my ideas on how to fix a movie. Until then, see you later. Have a good one.